We are now in the middle of a global health crisis. Our response as a nation must be swift, it must be coordinated, and it must be based on science and the facts. That's what we all want on a bipartisan basis. Unfortunately, when we look at the last three months objectively, it is clear that strategic errors and a failure of leadership impaired our nation's ability to respond to this outbreak. This, in turn, endangers us all. Let's start with testing. The Trump administration's testing for the coronavirus has been severely inadequate, plagued by missteps and resulted in substantial deficiency in our ability to determine who may be infected. Yesterday, Director Redfield testified that CDC has tested about 4,900 people. By comparison, South Korea tested more than 66,000 people with just one, within just one week of its first case of community transmission. South Korea has now tested more than 196,000 people, but we are not anywhere close to that. They started conducting drive-through testing, but he, people here in the United States can't even get tested by their own doctors. This is the United States of America. We're supposed to be leading the world. Instead, we are trailing far behind. How did South Korea test so many people so quickly, but we didn't even test a fraction of that number? Why did it take so long? We must do better. Unfortunately, these delays have been systemic. Just last week, the Trump administration promised to deliver a million tests by the end of the week, but it did not even come close. On Sunday, they admitted that they delivered only 75,000 tests. That's more than 900,000 tests short. And this was their own stated goal to the American people. Now the Trump administration is saying that they have distributed a million tests and will be distributing four million by the end of this week. But that's difficult to believe given their record. We need facts, we need information, and we need it quickly. If we don't have testing, we don't know the full scope of the problem. And if you don't test people, then you have no idea how many people are infected. We don't even know where community transmission is happening. We don't know where to direct resources. We are operating in the dark. My, my question is whether the administration and, and tr President Trump is exacerbating the crisis by downplaying it. Over and over again, we've heard blatant misstatements that consistently diminish this crisis and negatively affect our preparations and response. Last week, President Trump said, and I quote, anybody that needs a test gets a test. He said the tests are beautiful. He was absolutely wrong. My constituents are telling me they can't get tested. The same is true of President Trump's top advisor, Larry Kudlow, who made this incredible statement two weeks ago, and I quote, we have contained this. I won't say airtight, but pretty close to airtight. The business side, the economic side, I don't think it's going to be an economic tragedy at all. The numbers are saying the U.S. is holding up nicely, end quote. He could not have been more wrong. The stock market just had one of the worst weeks in history, with the single biggest point drop of all time in history. The president and his aides may think they are helping with political spin and happy talk, but the American people want the truth. Uh, we need the facts. We need accurate information. The CDC has now reported more than 647 cases across 36 states, but according to experts at John Hopkins and others, the real number is far higher. Uh, Ranking Member Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to our witnesses. The best practice is to maintain good hygiene. Number one, you can protect yourself and your family by practicing proper hand washing techniques and washing your hands often. Second, avoid crowds as much as possible and stay home if you are in fact sick. And, and, and third, we can protect ourselves from the virus like we do other viruses. For instance, cover your coughs and sneezes, avoid close contact with those who are sick, and clean and disinfect 
uh, your home frequently. All good common sense protocols and procedures that we should be implementing. Today I look forward to our experts offering some specific recommendations on how people can minimize um, the spread of the coronavirus. The Vice President explained yesterday that over a million test kits have been sent out to date. Today I hope we can learn more about the efforts to increase the number of these test kits that are going to be deployed. We should also understand that an increase in test kits will inevitably show an increase in positive cases around the country. Lastly, I want to say that oftentimes in this committee we disagree vigorously on many hot-button issues. We don't always see eye to eye on matters of oversight. But on this issue, I think we should all work together for the health and well-being of every American. We should not play politics with the coronavirus. We should not use it as a reason to advance partisan objectives. Now is the time for us to come together under President Trump's leadership and work to help all Americans. And if you will all please rise and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that they answered in the affirmative. Thank you and please be seated. We were able to very quickly go from an understanding of what this virus was to what the genetic sequence was to actually developing a vaccine. But there's a lot of confusion about developing a vaccine. In the next, I would say, four weeks or so, we will go into what is called a phase one clinical trial to determine if one of the candidates, and there are more than one candidate, there are probably at least 10 or so that are at various stages of development. The one that we've been talking about is one that involves a platform called messenger RNA but it really serves as a prototype for other types of vaccines that are simultaneously being developed. Getting it into phase one in a matter of months is the quickest that anyone has ever done literally in the history of vaccinology. However, the process of developing a vaccine is one that is not that quick. So we go into phase one, it'll take about three months to determine if it's safe, that'll bring us three or four months down the pike, and then you go into an important phase called phase two to determine if it works. Since this is a vaccine, you don't want to give it to normal, healthy people with the possibility that A, it will hurt them, and B, that it will not work. So the phase of determining if it works is critical. That will take at least another eight months or so. So when you've heard me say we would not have a vaccine, that would even be ready to start to deploy for a year to a year and a half. That is the time frame. Now, anyone who thinks they're going to go more quickly than that, I believe will be cutting corners that would be detrimental. What does that tell us? That tells us now, the next month, the next several months, we're going to have to rely on public health measures to contain this outbreak. This is a new virus and many uncertainties remain. Our public health response must be flexible. From the outset, CDC and the U.S. government partners implemented an aggressive multi-layer strategy to slow the introduction of this virus to the United States, to buy time for our scientists to learn how this virus behaves, to prepare our nation's public health infrastructure and healthcare system for the possibility of a global pandemic that would impact your communities and to educate Americans how best to prepare for eventual disruptions to their daily life and the potential risk to their families. The administration's interagency containment strategy relied on evidence-based public health interventions. Initially, early case recognition, isolation, and contact tracing, travel advisories and targeted travel restrictions, the use of quarantine for individuals returning from transmission hot zones such as China, Japan, and now the Grand Princess. Reports out of China looked at more than 70,000 individuals with this infection and found that 85 or 80 percent of the patients actually developed mild illness and recovered, while 10, 15 to 20 percent developed serious illness. Children and young people seem not to get sick. This disease disproportionately affects older adults and particularly those with serious underlying health conditions. Two months ago, Chinese science shared the genome sequence of the virus to the world, and within a week, CDC scientists developed a diagnostic test that is now being used in more than 75 U.S. public health labs across 50 states 
with the capacity in the public health system to test up to 75,000 people. I want to ask about testing. I'm being asked over and over again uh, why the United States is so far behind other countries and why the American people cannot get tested. Our, our first case of coronavirus was on January 21st, and the U.S. Has, has tested approximately 4,900 people so far. In contrast, South Korea has already tested almost 200,000 people. They can test 15,000 people a day. South Korea can test more people in one day than we tested over the past two months. So, Dr. Fauci, why are we so far behind Korea in testing and reporting uh, this yeah. crisis? Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Maloney. Uh, I, would, uh, I don't like to pass the buck, but uh, Dr. Uh, Redfield has the numbers and a little map that he might want to show you about that, because yeah. I don't have that in front of me. Okay. Right. Uh, is, the, is the worst yet to come, Dr. Fauci? Yes, it is. Can you elaborate? Well, whenever you have an outbreak that you can start seeing community spread, which means by definition that you don't know what the index case is and the way you can approach it is by contact tracing. When you have enough of that, then it becomes a situation where you're not going to be able to effectively and efficiently contain it. Whenever you look at the history of outbreaks, what you see now in an uncontained way, and although we are containing it in some respects, we keep getting people coming in from the country that are travel related. We've seen that in many of the states that are now involved. And then when you get community spread, it makes the challenge much greater. So I can say we will see more cases and things will get worse than they are right now. How much worse we'll get will depend on our ability to do two things, to contain the influx of in people who are infected coming from the outside and the ability to contain and mitigate within our own country. Bottom line, it's going to get worse. Well, bottom line, Mr. Fauci, uh, if we don't test people, then we don't know how many people are infected. Is that correct? That is correct. And as I'm sure that Dr. Redfield will tell you, as the looking forward right now, as commercial uh, entities get involved in making a large amount of tests getting variable, when you do two aspects of testing. One, a person comes in to a physician and asks for a test because they have symptoms or a circumstance which suggests they may be infected. The other way to do testing is to do surveillance, where you go out into the community and not wait for someone to come in and ask for a test, but you actively pro get, proactively get a test. We are pushing for that, and as Bob will, Dr. Redfield will tell you, that the CDC has already started that in six sentinel cities and will expand that in many more cities. But you're absolutely correct. We need to know how many people, to the best of ability, are infected, as we say, under the radar screen. Now, I, I'm about, uh, pardon me? I, I, I really want to get to South Korea and their 50 mobile testing sites that they've set up where people can just drive up, get a quick swab, get a test, and results in two days. And this is a question to Dr. Fauci and to Dr. Redfield. These uh, centers uh, uh, minimize interaction between patients. Uh, it helps mitigate the risk. Uh, uh, and, and why haven't we set up these mobile labs? Are we planning to set them up? Uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Redfield. Well, again, I'll start by telling you the NIH would in no way be responsible for okay. setting that up. So I okay. can't tell you All what right. I can do. Dr. Redfield. <laughs> uh, I, just to say very quickly, uh, CDC's role in this was we very rapidly, within almost seven to ten days, developed a test from an unknown pathogen once we had the sequence. Mm -hmm. And we did that because we wanted to get eyes on it, CDC, so the health departments across this nation can send samples to us and we would test them. <clears throat> Secondly, we rapidly tried to expand that and scale it up with a contractor so each public health lab in this country would have that test. During that process of quality control, we found out one of the reagents wasn't working appropriately and we had to modify that with the FDA that took uh, several weeks to get that completed. But the test was always available in Atlanta if you sent the sample to us. So there never was a time when the health department could not get a test. They had to send it to Atlanta. 
Now our health departments have 75,000 tests. Most health departments now, over 75 health departments have the test. Well, but Dr. The other Redfield, side, the other how, how many tests are we planning to produce in the United States? Well, from a public health point of view, we have put out 75,000. The other side, as Dr. Fauci said, which is really not what CDC does traditionally, is to get the medical private sector to have testing for patients. And when the Vice President brought all the testing companies to the White House last week, we got enormous cooperation for them all to work together. And as we sit here today, Quest and LabCorp are now offering this test in their doctor's offices throughout this country. But it's not for an individual just to take a test. They need to go see a healthcare professional, have an, an assessment, determine whether a test is indicated, and then get that test. In New York, just so you know, on February 29th, uh, uh, Her Harold uh, Zucker, your health commissioner, asked if he could use our EUA to begin to get Wadsworth approved. And the FDA worked with him within one day and got their test up and running in the state of New York at the Wadsworth lab. So we're working hard to get testing available. Uh, my role is to get it available for the public health system and, as Dr. Fauci said, start these large surveillance programs. But on the other side, there's a private sector to get it to clinical medicine. And I think you will see that with LabCorp and LabQuest out, um, those tests are rolling out. Finally, will, will these la private labs be reporting, and are they reporting into CDC their results? We have uh, set up now a, a surveillance system. Uh, are they reporting now? It's being worked as we speak okay. uh, today, that LabCorp and, and Quest will dump into our national reporting base. Okay. My time has expired, um, and I recognize the distinguished member. Oh, she's left. <laughs> okay. I recognize the gentleman from the great state of Tennessee, Mr. Green, is recognized. I'm incredibly disappointed in the politicization of this uh, COVID-19 response. The 24-7 criticism the President is undergoing is unwarranted at a minimum and absolutely maligns the hard work done over years as our nation's doctors and scientists at places like the CDC, the NIH, the FDA, the H HHS, DHS, FEMA, and DOD have prepared for just such an eventuality. Make no mistake about it, this virus is a serious problem. But that concern was immediately shown by our President as evidenced by his historic response. And I'd like to take a second to correct the record. On December 31st, Wuhan officials posted the first notice saying they were investigating a pneumonia outbreak. On January the 7th, the CDC established an incident management system just seven days later. On January the 17th, CDC sent 100 plus staffers to specific airports in the United States to screen all people coming from Wuhan. On January the 21st, just three weeks after the announcement, the CDC activated its Emergency Operations Center. On January the 29th, the President established the Presidential Task Force. On January the 30th, still less than a month from the initial announcement, the State Department issued a do not travel warning to China. January the 30th, the World Health Organization announced that the coronavirus is a public health emergency of international concern. Meaning, before the World Health Organization even announced a global concern, the administration was working on its response for almost a month and had already established a presidential task force. On January the 31st, to the cries of racism, President Trump proactively suspended entry of foreign nationals who had been to China in the last 14 days. On the 31st, the President issued quarantines and through Secretary Azar, a public health emergency for the entire nation. On February the 11th, the World Health Organization named the virus COVID-19. Let that sink in. The administration's first response a week after the Wuhan announcement. The virus hadn't even been named by the World Health Organization yet. It isn't named until day 42. Meanwhile, the CDC, the NIH, and all the agencies of our scientific community with acronyms that boggle the mind have been working feverishly to sequence the RNA of the virus, get its proteins, messenger RNA sequenced, and get a vaccine going. On February the 24th, the President unveiled the initial plan. On Yet, according to the leadership of the other party, our President has failed us. Months of response, and yet they're accusing our President of failing us. 
On February the 26th, the president appointed the vice president to head the whole of government response. That appointment is in keeping with the 2015 Obama-era Blue Ribbon Panel on Biodefense. On February 29th, 60 days after the Chinese announcement, sadly, America lost its first victim to COVID-19. So 53 days before America lost a single life to COVID-19, the administration was already working diligently to prepare our country. You've heard the witnesses describe the Herculean efforts their various departments are taking to protect the lives and health of Americans. I want to thank the dedicated men and women of CDC, NIH, FDA, HHS, DHS, FEMA, and DOD for the years of work that has gone into preparing for this type of effort and their tireless 24-7 response since the announcement just 71 days ago. America will lose lives to this virus. But as was noted by Obama appointee and former director of the CDC, Tom Friedman, had the president not responded so quickly, we would not have been prepared as we are and more lives would have been lost. Madam Chairman, I yield. I have to say that the president's statements from the beginning of this has been contrary to the direction that you have given us. The president on March 6th told the people in my district publicly that the tests were ready. Anybody who wants a test can go be tested. They're beautiful tests, beautiful tests. That's not a medical term. So my constituents went to their local health centers, went to their hospitals. There were no tests, zero, zero. And I know they're rolling out now, but this was, this was back on the 6th. That's not a good situation. He said this in front of some of you at a public hearing, at a press conference. And I saw no one step up and say, no, the president wasn't correct. The tests are not there. They're not ready. They're not beautiful. They're not available. So, so we, we need a unity of purpose, but we are not going to get that when the president is telling people that the cases of coronavirus are going down, not up. They doubled yesterday in my district. Doubled. And I represent part of Boston. Myself and Ms. Presley share that city. It's not a, 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 a backwater medically or technically. It's, it's very advanced. The president has made some bizarre statements here. And, and I, look, I want to be together with my Republican colleagues, but when the president said he has an uncle who went to MIT in the 1930s and that he has a natural affinity and an ability for this, it, it's got to it's gotta raise some red flags. We, we, we need you to step up. We need, and, and, you know, Dr. Fauci, you've been, you've been great on some of this stuff and pushing back. When the president said, we're going to get a vaccine fairly quickly, a matter of months, you know, you, you were good to step up and say, no, it's going to be a year and a half. But, you know, we, we, we really need honesty here. And when the president is, is making statements like this, we, we need pushback from, from the public health officials. You know, standing behind him and nodding silently or, or, or an eye roll once in a while is not going to get us. We really need, you know, when I say things, they're immediately considered political because I'm, 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 a, I'm a Democrat and I'm, I'm elected. But, you know, there's, you have a, a certain level of credibility and honesty that I think that, that, that should, should be persuasive to the American people. Um, so I, I just ask you to be more, more forthright uh, when the president... Uh, when the president makes statements like this. We need leadership, but, but we need people to be very much aware of the dangers that are out there. Uh, you know, the cases are not going down. The American people should be aware of that. You should be forthright in explaining that. When the secretary of the, uh, when the president's economic director says, we got this contained, not quite airtight, but almost there. We need you we need you, our public health officials, to step up and say that is not true. That is hurting us. That is making the spread of this virus, uh, uh, you know, more, more extended, more prolific, and, 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 and more possible. The American people really have to step up here and make sure that, uh, you know, they, they are aware of the dangers. Mr. F Dr. Fauci, go ahead. Mr. Lynch, I appreciate your comments, but I can tell you absolutely 
that I tell the president, the vice president, and everyone on the task force exactly what oh, the scientific I don't doubt data that. is and what the evidence is. Yeah. I have never, ever held back telling exactly what is going on from a public health standpoint. Thank you. Dr. Redfield, I, I think um, Dr. Fauci uh, uh, tossed over to you a few minutes ago the opportunity to speak about some of the issues and the concerns about getting the necessary medical supplies out to people. Uh, would you like to expand on what you weren't able to talk about earlier? I'd just like to, again, try to emphasize the development that we did for the diagnostic test. And again, I do think we developed that very rapidly so that the public health community could have eyes on. That test was at CDC. We rapidly tried to get it to the health departments. During our quality control, we, we basically found one of the reagents wasn't working. But as I said today, we got that public health labs now throughout this country have adequate testing to do their public health mission. The other side of the mission is the clinical mission, and I think that's the concern of most American citizens. How do I get evaluated? And again, that really has then worked through the private sector. Uh, it wasn't really the public health lead for CDC to get the laboratory test. But they will say that the test we did develop, we published and let everybody use it. They could redevelop it. The, there was regulatory relief, so any CLIA certified lab, according to the FDA, was given relief. They could develop the test just like we did and they could use it and some universities have done that. We also uh, was relieved to IDT, the, the manufacturer that made our test for public health purposes. They were given the regulatory relief to actually make that test and sell it to hospitals and that's the one million, three million tests that people referred to that are rolling out for that side. But most importantly, and we really need to give credit to the diagnostic companies of this nation. When they met with the vice president, they didn't come one company at a time. They had already agreed as a group they're going to figure out how to get this diagnostic test as rapidly as possible for the American public that need it. And as I said today, uh, yesterday they began that, both LabTorb and Quest. So there should be, again, increasing, increase in availability across this nation through the private sector. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm delighted to hear the bipartisan praise of our public health workers, our professionals, and I hope that colleagues on both sides of the aisle will heed your good advice. First question, can U.S. doctors or patients order some of these tests from South Korea? Important question when was asked by the, the chairwoman um, about the difference. The difference between the South Korean test and our test is they would have to go through our regulatory process in the FDA to get approval to use that. So the answer is no. Currently, no, under the regulatory issue. Okay. What are the names of these South Korean companies or enterprises that offer these tests? The basic difference, uh, Congressman, is when we, CDC, developed our test, if you give me a second, we developed uh, to make sure it could work on the platforms that we'd put in all the public health labs. Those platforms were based on our flu surveillance. So we used a technique called thermocycling, which is not a high throughput. Um, what the Koreans have done is they've used a high throughput pr platform, which is now being done in New York at the Wadsworth Lab, um, and is now beginning, it's being worked on by LabCorp and Quest to bring it in. So it's a different platform. Roche is really the company, I think, I'm not sure, but I can get back to you, which was the platform that they used. It's a high throughput, allows many, many, many tests to be done at a single time. So the South Koreans used a Swiss company, or wherever Roche is headquartered, to supply the need. I'll get back to you on the specifics, sir. Make sure I don't misinform you. So American doctors or patients will have to Google this to try to find out because we're not eliciting this information today. Uh, we will get back to you, but I will tell you LabCorp and Quest are up aboard and most American doctors either use one of those two uh, lab services for their clinical practice. Well, LabCorp and Quest are wonderful companies, but still we are behind South Korea in terms of making testing available. So uh, how do we solve this gap? The, uh, what's going on right now, rather than the public health platform that we used, if we had developed the test on the Korean platform, none of our public health labs could have done it because they don't have the instrumentation. So right now the private sector and certain labs have begun to transfer that to the high, what we call the high throughput. 
And so you're going to see those high throughput, the same technology uh, is going to be approved in the United States and used by different private sector groups. So now finally we're turning toward what you call high throughput, and that may be from Roche, it may be from somewhere else, or maybe at the Wadsworth Lab now in New York, but finally one day we will have it. Yeah, I would try not to use the word finally. I guess I'm not making myself no. clear. In my role to get it in the public health labs, we build it on a platform that they had the instrumentation. What's the name of the company that supplied the faulty reagent? Well, it was, uh, it should be careful, it, it, the third control did not perform the way we wanted it to perform. There's two possibilities. One, that that reagent at that time, there was a contamination. But the other possibility is biologic, that these primer well, pairs folded on themselves and it didn't perform. It's been corrected and okay. the new Substandard, tests Substandard, faulty, whatever name you want to use, what's the name of that company? Well, it was produced by IDT, you know, initially, and, and, and we've worked with them to correct that and CDC together. Are there any plans to have drive-through testing in America so that we do not panic emergency rooms when people come in and cough? Not at this time. I think we're trying to maintain the relationship between individuals and their health care providers. That's very interesting as a response. Uh, so the professional monetary relationship comes before public health. No, that was not my point. Maybe Dr. Fauci wants to comment. My point was in able to assess risk and the appropriateness that these individuals get the proper care, we believe that this is something that still has value to be dealt with within the setting of clinical medicine. But I'll ask Tony to comment. It's, it's exactly what you said. It's trying to pre not anything about monetary. That's really not a consideration at all. It's to try and get people to, to at least on a, on a telephone call basis, to be able to phone their physicians ahead of time and say, I believe I have a situation. The physician would probably say, stay at home and give them the, the instructions of how to get a test. But so it, it's the relationship between the patient and the physician. I have no indication at all of financial on that. Well, most Americans don't really have a doctor. Uh, they rely on the ER to help, and people are panicking ERs, apparently. Uh, I see that my time has expired. Would, would we be in a worse situation, for example, had there not been some travel restrictions? Uh, I believe we would be in a worse position. Uh, is there any way that the regulations, rules that are standing in the way of the FDA from uh, getting tests here being purchased, is there any way those regs can be waived? in a national emergency? Initially, the regulations were, in fact, uh, there, and, they, and that's why we had to go through and get approval. Um, the uh, uh, commissioner actually gave regulatory relief so that in, any individual now can go back and do it. But you just answered a moment ago that we cannot purchase those tests from South Korea. So, and you said because of regulatory interference. My question is, can those regulatory uh, requirements be waived in a national emergency? I would have to refer that to the Commissioner of the F uh, FDA. Okay, and last question real quickly, and I want to yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, uh, Dr. Redfield. Are our tests better than their tests? More accurate? I would say our tests are accurate. I'm not going to compare it to theirs. Okay, I just want to know if we're talking apples to apples or, or something else. So, so far as you know, the uh, South Korean tests are accurate as well. I would assume, I can only comment that our tests are accurate. All right. With that, I want to yield to the gentleman from Tennessee. Congressman Heist, thank you. Uh, Dr. Redfield, I was on the phone yesterday with the CDC and the NIH, and they suggested that the South Korean test used only a single IG and not IgG and IgM. Would you explain to my colleagues here why that single immunoglobulin test versus ours, which is a two immunoglobulin test, why our test is so much better. Congressman, you're referring to the uh, test, actually, the test that we're currently using and they're using to detect uh, acute infection is to measure the antigen that's in the oral uh, nasal or pharyngeal space, and they're actually using a molecular test for that. What you're referring to is the test that we're trying to develop to understand the full extent of this outbreak, and that is a serological test. And there, or they can measure it in or, oral and nasal secretions and measure certain, like an IgG. CDC has developed two serological tests that we're evaluating right now so we can get an idea through surveillance, what's the extent 
of this outbreak. How many people really are infected? And that is being moved out now to do these extensive surveillance programs. Would, Madam Chairman, you, can I get one more question on that same line? Or do you, I, can, I can wait for someone else to yield. Thank you. Let, let's wait for someone else. I want to try to keep to the five minutes because many members are here and they all have important questions on both sides of the aisle. I, I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley. He's recognized for five minutes. I and I appreciate chair. his help on this hearing. I thank the and, chair. Some of my friends on the other side of the aisle, including the ranking member, began sanctimoniously to say, we don't want to politicize this issue. Too important. Well, we didn't politicize the fact that the global health and security uh, and biodefense desk at the National Security Council was dismantled by this administration two years ago. We didn't politicize the funding of health, public health in the United States in budget after budget that in fact made critical cuts, which we restored. We aren't the ones that called the alarm being raised about this pandemic as fake news. That came out of the President of the United States' mouth. And no gaslighting is going to hide that. And politicization. When the President of the United States finally did go down to CDC, with you, Dr. Redfield, he appeared wearing this hat, a campaign hat, in the middle of a crisis. We will not be lectured about politicization, and all of your words and sanctimony will not cover up the fact that this administration was not prepared for this crisis, and it put lives at risk, American lives at risk. We didn't have the tests we needed. We didn't have the diagnostics we needed. The president made patently false assertions, which Dr. Fauci correctly corrected about the development of, of, of the virus. In fact, he was more concerned about what was happening on the stock market than he seemed to be concerned about American public health. And that's shameful, and you can't cover that up. And we will not be silent, nor will we be intimidated by charges of politicization in pointing it out, because lives are at stake. Was it a mistake, Dr. Fauci, do you believe, uh, to dismantle the uh, office in, within the National Security Council charged with global health and security? Well, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as a mistake. I would say we worked very well with that office. It would be nice if the office was still there. Well, we have a bill to solve that, a bipartisan bill. I thank you and I thank the chair. I want to talk a little bit about the numbers in China and what we expect the numbers to be in the United States. Uh, the things I have here show that right now in China there have been about 3,000 deaths. Do you guys agree that we're probably the worst is over in China, or do you think that number is going to continue to escalate or slowly drop? I think China is a, a great sign of encouragement. They, they, they had, uh, in the last couple of days, they've really gone down to under 50 cases per day. So they really have now got control of their outbreak. In the United States, when you look at the trajectory of what happened in China and what happened in the United States, um, based upon what, what were three weeks, a month, or how, how far are we into this uh, situation in the United States? Yeah, I think that's the critical question, that for a period of time, this outbreak seems to go in a very arithmetic way, and then it goes logarithmic. So, for example, you can just go back three weeks ago, and Italy had hardly any infections. They had almost 1,800 right. infections confirmed just last night. Right. So, so we are fighting hard now between our containment strategy, and as Dr. Fauci will say, the expanded mitigation. Right. Let's, let's, let's compare it to something the average American understands, and that's the common flu. C can you tell us every year kind of where we start and how much it grows and how many new people get the flu every day? Yeah. I can't give you a precise number, sir, but <clears throat> one of the things we're trying to emphasize to the American people... Well, I, I only have my five minutes. Can, can you tell us about how many people, say, get the flu every year and how many new people are diagnosed? Get the flu? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. You know, we about 5% or so to 10% of the population. We have about 30,000 deaths. It ranges from 15,000 to about 69, 79,000 per year. Okay. Um... Based upon the current trajectory, how many people do you think will get this new virus and how many people do you think will die? 
you cannot predict. And that's I know you can't predict, but there must be, you know, you, 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 we have a graph. We have the beginning of a graph. We know this is going to go up. We have the experience of China. We have the experience of Italy. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you give us some projections? It is going to be totally dependent upon how we respond to it. So I can't give you a number. If, if, if we now sit back complacently... I'm not asking to be complacent. I'm asking for a realistic... I mean, that's what the public is looking I for. I can't give you a realistic number until we put into the factor of how we respond. If we are complacent and don't do really aggressive containment and mitigation, the number could go way up and be involved in many, many millions. If we taught to contain, we could flatten it. So there's no number answer to your question until we okay. act upon it. Uh, I'll give you a question. Now, we mentioned earlier today that uh, I think one of the basketball tournaments, I think, for the Ivy League, uh, they've cut off their tournament altogether. On the other, nobody talks about, you know, every, every night they play like, I don't know, eight to ten NBA games and nobody talks about shutting them down. Uh, is the NBA underreacting or is the Ivy League overreacting? We would recommend that there not be large crowds. If that means not having any people in the audience when the NBA mean, plays, so be it. But as a public health official, anything that has large crowds is something that would give uh, a yeah, risk to spread. I'll emphasize again. You said about 30,000 people die every year uh, from the from the regular flu. Do we know the ages of the people so far who are dying of the, uh, of the new flu? Yeah, so for, for uh, the, the coronavirus right now, for example, in Italy, the average age of death is over the age of 80. Most of the deaths that we've seen are over the age of 70. Okay. Um, I'll yield, maybe give uh, Dr. Green another chance to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, Dr. Fauci, you took the Hippocratic Oath, right? You took the Hippocratic Oath? Okay. Are you offended by someone suggesting that you might intentionally not speak out when you're confronted with something that could harm your patients and violate your Hippocratic Oath? Yeah, I just made that point a few moments ago. As I've said, I have always, not only with this administration, and Madam Chairperson, you said I served four presidents. With all due respect to Reagan and George H.W. Bush, I've served six presidents, and I have never done anything other than tell the exact scientific evidence and made policy recommendations based on the science and the evidence. Okay. Um, uh, yesterday, the governor of Illinois said, I'm very frustrated with the federal government. We have not received enough tests. I want to understand why. Director Redfield. Director Redfield, over here. The first coronavirus case in the U.S. was confirmed on January 21. At that point, CDC began developing uh, a test kit to diagnose coronavirus cases. The FDA gave CDC emergency authorization to manufacture and issue this test kit around February 4th. Isn't that right? Unfortunately, however, testing did not get underway because of problems with the test kits. Specifically, CDC's Atlanta manufacturing facility had quality control problems. On February 24th, one month after coronavirus was found in America, officials discovered that CDC's Atlanta facility was contaminated. Whether it was because of the contamination or biologic problems, which you had alluded to, test kits coming from that facility were flawed and had to be replaced dramatically slowing down our response. Dr. Redfield, I know you are investigating the cause of the contamination in the Atlanta facility. Is the person who oversaw the Atlanta facility at the time of the contamination still in charge of the current manufacturing process? This is uh, currently under uh, an investigation at this point, and I think I'm going to leave it there. Sir, you can't give us assurance that the person who bungled the production process it hasn't been removed. Recovering from that misstep cost us precious weeks and now months, sir. Meanwhile, the virus spread and people died. I respectfully disagree with your earlier characterization that uh, we had an aggressive response and we had an early diagnosis when one month after the first coronavirus case was detected, we still had not shipped manufacturing, or we had still not shipped test kits 
to public labs. Now let's currently discuss testing efforts underway in the U.S. and other countries. You have a, a copy of this chart before you. We talked about South Korea and the U.S. Let me just drill down for a second because this is very instructive. The U.S. and South Korea uh, both experienced their first confirmed coronavirus cases roughly within a day of each other. The U.S. on January 21st and South Korea on January 20th. Interestingly, both countries developed a test to diagnose coronavirus roughly around the same time. The U.S. on February 4th and South Korea on February 7th, just three days later. But then our testing uh, at that point, the activities diverged dramatically. Here we have a chart that shows the testing activities of four countries, the U.S., South Korea, Italy, and the U.K., on three separate dates in the, three past, in, the, in the past three weeks. You see, from zero till March 10th, South Korea tested 4,000 people for every million persons in its population. Italy, in the blue bar, tested 1,000 people for every million people in the population. UK, 400 for every million. Now, where is the red bar representing the United States, Dr. Redfield? Um, I don't see it on that graph. I don't see it either, but I can assure you that the data is there. It just doesn't show up. It doesn't show up. It turns out that Korea had tested 4,000 people for every million of its citizenry, and we are at 15 people for every million people in this country. That's a, that's a response, a testing response that's almost 300 times more aggressive than what's here in this country. And the problem, Dr. Redfield, is that when we don't test as rapidly as we should, the virus spreads and people die. Now let's talk about the situation going forward. Vice President Mike Pence said on Monday, quote, before the end of this week, another four million tests will be distributed. But the real question I submit is not when the tests will be distributed, it's when the tests will be performed on people so that they can know whether they have contracted coronavirus. Now, South Korea currently tests 15,000 people per day. Whether it's through high throughput, low throughput, medium throughput, it doesn't matter. They test 15,000 people per day. Dr. Redfield, when are we going to be reaching 15,000 people per day tested in this country? Well, first I'd say, Mr. Congressman, it, it really does depend on the clinical indication. I think one thing I would like to uh, point out again, the CDC developed this test for the United States public health system. We did not develop this test for all of clinical medicine. The cl test for clinical medicine, we count on the private sector to work together with the FDA to bring those tests to bear. And I said, finally... So you're blaming the private sector. I'm not sector. blaming. I'm just you're trying to... You're passing the buck to the I private sector. Blaming. Sir, because of this, the virus is spreading. People are getting sick. People are dying. Thank you. I've been very disappointed to hear some of the comments by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Chairman, Chairwoman Maloney mentioned the political spin. Mr. Connolly mentioned the politic politicization and fake news. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that have been written and, and said by the press and uh, Democrat leadership. The New York Times over a little over two weeks ago had a headline, quote, let's call it Trump virus. If you're feeling awful, you know who to blame. And then House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn said when asked if he had confidence in the administration's response, he said, quote, absolutely not. They're just fooling around. It just reminds me so much of Katrina. So I take a bit of issue with the politicization of uh, something that should be focused on bipartisanship and working together to save lives. Because we have a crisis. Uh, Americans are, are truly and rightfully concerned. And I think that, that Congress needs to uh, work hand-in-hand -hand with the administration. I don't believe the administration's gotten the credit it deserves, uh, especially with respect to the president's early decision to cut off the border, which has uh, undoubtedly given the CDC and health officials time to prepare for this outbreak. 
I'm not confident the last administration would have made that decision for fear of political incorrectness or, or whatever. So I, I think the president should get a lot of credit for, for making that decision. Uh, Dr. Fauci, we've got two enemies uh, in this crisis. One is the virus and one is misinformation about the virus. And I want to quickly clear up a few things that have been said over the course of this process. One was by the president um, in early February when he said, it looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. Is there any scientific reason to believe that? The basis for any uh, surmising that that might happen is based on what we see every year with influenza, which actually, as you get to March and April and May, it actually goes way down, and other non-novel coronavirus, but common cold coronaviruses often do that. So for someone to, to, to at least consider that that might happen is reasonable, but, underline but, we do not know what this virus is going to do. We would hope that as we get to warmer weather, it would go down. But we can't proceed under that assumption. We've got to assume that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Okay. Uh, the president predicted that there could be a vaccine in a few months. I think you contradicted that today, and I think you contradicted that at that time. I just want you to be very clear. Is there any chance we will have a vaccine in a few months? No, I made myself clear in my statement. Okay. Uh, Dr. <clears throat> Redfield, the first case of community spread of coronavirus took place on February 26. That's, that is infection of someone who did not have a clear travel history to China or direct contact with someone who did. Why wasn't the decision made on February 26 to expand your testing criteria for anyone displaying corona-like symptoms at that point instead of waiting until March 4th to broaden the criteria? Well, that's a good question, Congressman. I mean, we always left the discretion to do testing to the local public health group. If you look, we always had uh, that discretion. We never refused testing from anybody, but we did give guidance, as you point out, originally to do testing for individuals that presented with certain clin clinical scenarios um, secondary um, uh, to travel to China. That, those two cases in California and uh, several others obviously led us to reconsider those and make it very clear that we wanted up front to tell clinicians if they suspect it and the health department suspect it, they should uh, send that sample to the health department or us to CDC. Okay, we've been hearing stories about people who have had very compelling reasons to get tested but were not able to. I'll give you one example. A nurse in California was quarantined after treating a patient who had coronavirus and then showed symptoms of the disease herself. On March 5th, the day after you brought in the testing criteria, she put out a statement about her situation and she said, I quote, the public county officer called me and verified my symptoms and agreed with testing, but the national CDC would not initiate testing. They said they would not test me because if I were wearing the recommended protective equipment, then I wouldn't have had the coronavirus. Are you familiar with this case? Case. No, and I, I would think that this is a misunderstanding if it did occur. Okay, so um, what, what is the standing criteria, the, the, the existing criteria for testing now, so we have no confusion about it? Again, it's the, um, at the, the if a clinical physician, a physician, nurse practitioner, healthcare provider feels a test is indicated, then we... Based on what? Based on their clinical assessment. And that's, that's based on the, does it require that the person have to have had contact with someone who had been on a cruise no, or who had been to China? This is their clinical assessment. We're not going to judge the clinical assessment. We also say if it's the clinical assessment of the, or if it's the assessment of the public health department, that those individuals, and again, these are decisions. What happens is in the, in the time when testing was limited to health departments, the local health department makes that decision. Uh, and then they, uh, but they have followed CDC guidance. Now uh, we've made it very clear it's up to the individual health care provider and the individual public health to make that decision. Okay, could you make uh, a public service announcement right now for people who are asking the question of whether or not they should be tested? I, I hear from constituents who are having flu like symptoms. They want to know what should they do? What should they do? Well, as Dr. Fauci said, the first thing I would do is to tell them to contact their health care provider or their emergency room and tell them they're concerned they may have coronavirus infection and then follow their instructions to where to get the test. 
all right, it, and, and then proceed, proceed uh, uh, with getting the appropriate clinical evaluation. Okay, so they should call someone before they go anywhere. Well, we'd like to do that because yeah. if you really think you're infected, we're trying to avoid someone to walk into a 200-person, 100-person emergency room first. It's just to call in advance, and then they'll arrange exactly how they're going to get the test, how they're going to see the patient. They're going to be prepared when that patient comes to the emergency room that they're going to be able to isolate them, get them tested, get them properly evaluated. Okay. Roger. Thank you for your work on behalf of the American people. I yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Fauci, can you, by way of comparison, briefly explain what's, how does COVID-19 compare to other previous health situations, SARS, H1N1, uh, things okay. like that. Sure, sir. Thank you for the question. Uh, well, SARS was also a coronavirus in 2002. It infected 8,000 people, and it killed about 775. It had a mortality of about 9 to 10 percent. So that's only 8,000 people. In about a year, in the two and a half months that we've had this coronavirus, as you know, we now have multiple multiples of that. So it clearly is not as lethal, and I'll get to the lethality in a moment, but it certainly spreads better. Probably for the practical understanding of the American people, the seasonal flu that we deal with every year has a mortality of 0.1%. The stated mortality overall of this, when you look at all the data, including China, is about 3%. It first started off as 2 and now 3. I think if you count all the cases of minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic infection, that probably brings the mortality rate down to somewhere around 1%, which means it is 10 times more lethal than the seasonal flu. I think that's something that people can get their arms around and understand. Right. You know, I know there's been a run on Purell, but I think soap right. and water works just as well, uh, just in terms of that case. But it does require people to frequently wash their hands and maintain good hygiene, cover the cough, cover a sneeze, don't touch your face, uh, and again, ensure that you continue to wash your hands. And, Keep. And my understanding in the legislation we just passed last week, too, uh, you know, face masks for health professionals, uh, of course, not for every citizen walking around, but for health professionals, that we have a U.S. supplier that could provide them, but we, uh, House leadership, didn't put the legal framework in it necessary. Is there anything the FDA is doing to, to allow U.S.-based companies to participate better? Uh, sir, I think one thing the uh, FDA issued was emergency use authorization about expanding the use of particular masks and 95 respirators that could be used. Uh, regarding the testing, Dr. Fauci, uh, we've had people calling 911, showing no symptoms, asking for an ambulance to take them to a hospital to be tested. Uh, so uh, who should be tested? At what point should they be tested? At what point are the tests actually helpful? Uh, what about false negatives? Those kind of questions. Who should be really concerned about this? Okay, so, so very briefly, as Dr. Redfield has responded multiple times on this, there were really two, two uh, buckets, if you want to call it. If you have someone who has a reason to believe that they're infected, either that they have symptoms or they have come into contact with someone who is either travel related or who is in fact documented to have been infected or exposed. That's something where you go to a physician, you get a test, and you find that if an individual is infected. The other that was discussed a, a fair amount over the last several minutes is a surveillance type where you're not looking to see if anybody's been exposed, but you want to find what the penetrance of this particular infection is. And that's a different thing than the physician patient relationship. That's trying to get a feel for what's out there. And that's what the CDC is doing now in six sentinel cities, and they will expand that throughout the country so that we will be able to, hopefully very soon, to get an idea for getting the people who think they may be infected, who actually is infected. Uh, like all of the members up here, we are getting constant uh, communication from our constituents wanting more information. And I applaud all of you for being forthright with the American public. That's exactly what we need. Uh, in times like this, 
communication is so important, and if you're going to err on one side or the other, over-communication clearly is more important than uh, under-communication. We do not have enough test kits. We know that many individuals, as the uh, uh, my, my fellow member to the right of me, Mr. Raskin, pointed out, there are individuals who have requested test kits and have not been able to access them. My understanding is as late as last Saturday, ground zero in King County, Washington, that the healthcare professionals from that facility still did not have access to test kits. Uh, Mr. Redfield, do you know if that is true or not? Uh, we have provided test kits to the health department. Uh, the University of Washington has developed their own tests. That Were those test kits available last Friday? Yes, sir. Thank you. And without test kits, is it possible that those that have been susceptible to influenza might have been miscategorized as to what they actually had, that it's quite possible that they actually had uh, COVID-19? The standard practice is the first thing you do is test for influenza. So if they had influenza, they would be positive for But only if they were tested. So if they weren't tested, we don't know what they had. Correct. Okay. And if somebody dies from influenza, are we doing post-mortem testing to see whether it was influenza or whether it was COVID-19? There is a surveillance system of death from pneumonia that the CDC has. It's not in every city, every state, every hospital. So we could have people in the United States dying for what appears to be influenza when, in fact, it could be the coronavirus or COVID-19. Some cases have been actually diagnosed that way in the United States today. Thank you. And I would go back to uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, you, you, you talked about uh, this is serious. We are seeing activities across the nation, school closing, sporting events being uh, discussed about having them held in other places, major events being canceled or rescheduled. This would suggest this is a really serious issue. And I, I share the thoughts of the member from Wisconsin that I think we're concerned that we're not getting the full understanding or modeling that has taken place that would suggest the true impact of this virus across the United States, as well as potential models for deaths. Can you elaborate a little bit? And I, I get that there's no perfect model, but can you be uh, helpful in helping us understand what we're really looking at here? Yeah, if you look at the curves of outbreaks historically that are similar to this, the curve looks like this, and then it goes up exponentially. And that's the reason why it depends on how you respond now. So if we wait till we have many, many more cases, we will be multiple weeks behind. You know, I used the analogy at the press conference yesterday, and I'll use it today. It's the old metaphor that the Wayne Gretzky approach, you know, you skate not to where the puck is, but to where the puck is going to be. If we don't do very serious mitigation now, that what's gonna happen is that we're gonna be weeks behind and the horse is gonna be out of the barn. And that's the reason why we've been saying, even in areas of the country where there are no or few cases, we've gotta change our behavior. We have to essentially assume that we are gonna get hit. And that's why we talk about making mitigation and containment in a much more vigorous way. People ask, why would you want to make any mitigation? We don't have any cases. That's when you do it. Because we want this curve to be this. And it's not going to do that unless we act now. I, you know, I talk about, you know, about, politic about politicization, which shouldn't happen. We should be together on this. But one thing that really astounded me was the, uh, all the talking heads and some members of Congress criticizing uh, Vice President Mike Pence being kind of put, take the lead on this and head this up because he's not a medical professional. Uh, I would think uh, when I look at this that a uh, uh, person at that, that office, that level of that office, that helps bring the agencies together, maybe help clean out some of the red tape and the bureaucracy, would you concur that that's been helpful? to have that level of, of our top level of our government involved at this, that level for your working relationship, when you, especially you're working between agencies? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I just make that point because I, I hear that criticism and I think that they're either being political or they don't know what the heck they're talking about. Probably a little, a little of both. We need to be focused not on personalizing this, but figuring out what we can do to solve the issue. Now, one of the things that I think this should teach us as a country 
with all the anti-government rhetoric. Let's, why do we need government? Government is the problem. How about we consider how inadequately we have been funding government and public health? The CDC budget is $11 billion, 1.5 percent of our defense budget, $738 billion. Dr. Redfield, do you think our country would have been safer if, let's say, we had twice the CDC budget, if we had put it at 3 percent of our national defense budget and our capacity? Thank you, Congressman. I think it's important to realize that for, you know, decades we've underinvested in the public health infrastructure of this nation. While you have the country's attention, how much would that cost? Because right now we're spending, I think most people realize this is a national security issue. And we're putting 1.5 percent into the CDC of the defense budget. The NIH budget is 41 billion, which is less than 5 percent of national security. I mean, why isn't there a bipartisan call to double these budgets, triple these budgets? I mean, what would you ask the American people in Congress to prepare? I appreciate the opportunity, uh, co Congressman, and I'd have to get to back to you with an exact uh, um, estimate of all that for you. Dr. Fauci, do you have a view? Yeah, I mean, we've been, we've been well-funded at the NIH, but I think that we need to continue to have a consistent well-funding. What happens is that there's inconsistency at times, but luckily over the last four or five years the Congress has been quite generous with us. One question I do have is the WHO had tests and uh, some of the other countries use these tests. Uh, why shouldn't we be using these tests? I think it's important to understand about the key for uh, proving tests in this country from other countries. They can go ahead and apply through the FDA and, and get registration and be dispersed. Um, obviously, one of the reasons we developed the test that we developed was to try to make it as available as rapidly to the American public for public health. So I would defer that question to the commissioner at what the exact hoops are for the foreign companies to get their test approved. Do you think we need to look at streamlining in these types of crises, uh, approval for things like WHO testing, which is 60 other countries are using, or there are stories in the New York Times about how uh, leading scientists had come up with tests in Seattle that weren't approved? I mean, is, there's got to be a better way of getting these tests out there. I will say that uh, when this was recognized, when I was practicing in the Army, I could develop a test and, and, and then use it in clinical medicine. Uh, somehow between then and now, uh, there was not regulatory discretion for us to do laboratory developed tests. The Commissioner did though, I think it was on February 29th, issue regulatory discretion so the University of Washington or, or uh, say Columbia could actually develop their own test and actually use it and rather than have to file what we call an emergency use authorization, they could start using their test and file that 15 days later. Let, let me ask one final question. I genuinely believe that we have the most brilliant scientists, entrepreneurs in the world in the United States. And the question is, if we want to come up with an antiviral treatment, vaccine treatment, what, did it, what is it, and I want both Dr. Fauci and Dr. Ralphville to answer, what is it more that you need from Congress? Because no one cares about us lecturing people. No one cares about what we have to do. What, what, what are the resources that you need so the scientists and the technology and the entrepreneurs can solve this? And from the NIH standpoint, it's the consistency of funding, which, which thankfully you've been able to do. Uh, you know, back from 1998 to 2003, you doubled the NIH budget. Then we went through a very, very flat, long period of time, which actually was very difficult because it discouraged young investigators from getting involved. For the last few years, we've had a good, consistent increase. What you can do is to continue to give the kind of investment in biomedical research that is consistent and predictable. Okay. And I would say, first and foremost, uh, if, uh, the, well, the most important thing that you already have done is the establishment of the Rapid Response Fund. You know, prior to that, we would have to go to our foundation and ask them to raise money for us to respond to an emergency. The, uh, the, the gentleman's time has expired. And uh, let me intervene uh, here. I've been told that our witnesses need to leave now. I don't know what is going on at the White House. The White House is telling reporters that this meeting is not an emergency. They are saying it was scheduled yesterday. However, that's not what your staff just told us. 
Your staff said the White House did not tell them about this sudden meeting until this morning, right before our hearing. There seems to be a great deal of confusion and a lack of coordination at the White House. I hope this does not reflect on the broader response to this crisis. Madam Chair. We have asked your staff if you can come back and resume this hearing at 2 o'clock after your meeting at the White House. They have not responded to our request. Madam Chair. I am not going to adjourn this hearing. I am going to recess it. Uh, we haven't even gotten through half of our members Madam on Chair. either side of the. Uh, excuse me, I am. Uh, I am. Uh, and you have a moment. Uh, no, I am finishing my statement. Uh, we haven't even gotten through half of our members. We will continue to work with your staff to have you back to finish the hearing and answer the rest of the questions from our members. Fi finally, let me close with this. This committee sent you a request for information a week ago. We asked for basic information about the crisis and your plans for the response. But you have not provided us with anything. We understand that you are incredibly busy, but a lot of this information should be at your fingertips. We need this information because we keep getting sometimes misinformation from the White House. And we have an independent obligation to the American people. So I have one last question. Will you commit to producing the information we requested at least regarding testing, Dr. Fauci? Madam Chairperson, I'm not sure what information you're referring to that we did not provide. My, we are talking about the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious we, we, we Diseases. We sent a letter with all the subcommittee chairs and myself requesting information to every department, uh, okay. yours, uh, the CDC, right. FDA. I will, I will check this immediately after to find out Thank what you. the issue is. Thank you. Uh, Madam, Thank you. Madam Thank Chair, you very may, much. may I say, just interject here for one second? I've got a, a timely issue. I know you all need to go down to the White House. Madam but Chair, I, 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 do I do as wanna... well. I have a very specific district-related question. There are people in danger. Madam, in Madam Chair, I've, I've, just got, I've got the floor here for a second. Please, uh, please uh, uh, we will yield to the ranking member and then to the gentlelady from Florida okay. for the last question. I, Madam I think the Chair. Chair. I think With all due respect, I believe I was next in line. Okay. If we're, nope. if we're, right. gonna, if we're not going to follow committee procedures. Point, point well taken. Thank regular you very order. Much, ma regular order. Uh, we are going to recess as, as after, after I recognize the ranking member for his closing statement. Well, and I appreciate the chairwoman. Uh, I, we all recognize the importance of what's going on here, and I think it's important to have level heads about what's happening and that we, we want to make sure that you guys can go do your work. Yet I've got an email right here from city council mayor and leadership in San Antonio saying they don't have adequate plans on what to do with those who have, been, who have tested positive. So I expect you all to come back down here today in accordance with what the chair is asking for so that we can have those questions answered. Thank you. Well, uh, responding to the re uh, ranking uh, member, will you all be back at 2 o'clock today? Now, we're going to have to just check. I, uh, the, the reason I'm saying that, uh, Madam Chairperson, is that we have a task force meeting at what time is it? We have a task force meeting at 3.30 in the White House. Uh, I will get myself down here at 2 if you would like me down here, but I would have to be at the task force meeting at 3.30 in the White House. I don't know how we're going to work that. We'll continue discussion. We'll stand at recess uh, so that you can get to this meeting. Right. We are in recess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your service, your testimony. It's tremendously helpful. Thank you. This hearing was originally scheduled to go until about 12.30. The chair announced at the start of the hearing that it was being cut short because of an emergency meeting today at the White House, which at least two of the witnesses would be attending. To take you now to Senator Bernie Sanders making comments after his campaign last night. That Donald Trump is the most dangerous president in the modern history of our country, and he must be defeated. Tragically, we have a president today who is a pathological liar and it was running a corrupt administration. He clearly does not understand the Constitution of the United States and thinks that he is a president who is above the law. In my view, he is a racist, 
a sexist, a homophobe, a xenophobe, and a religious bigot.